Anyone? So do we have a volunteer who would care to unmute their mic and just read this? It's no big words, promise, um, because it's more meaningful if somebody else reads it. Volunteer. Sure, I'll read it. We recognize that many Indigenous nations have long-standing relationships with the territories upon which the Learning for a Sustainable Future organization works. Learning for a Sustainable Future and York University acknowledge their presence on the traditional territory of many Indigenous nations. The area known as Tikaranto has been taken care of by the Anishinaabek Nation, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, the Huron-Wendat, and the Métis. It is now home to many Indigenous peoples. We acknowledge the current treaty holders, the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. This territory is subject of the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant an agreement to peaceably share and care for the Great Lakes region. Tikaranto is built on sacred land that is part of an agreement between Indigenous peoples and then extended to allied nations to peacefully and respectfully care for it. By personally making a land acknowledgement, you are taking part in an act of reconciliation, honoring the land and Indigenous heritage, which dates back over 10,000 years. Thank you very much. So thanks a lot for being part of this session. Um, it, it, it says a lot about all of us that we are interested in going forward and changing things up and uh, uh, changing our practice for the better and using the out of doors as a large classroom. And uh, perhaps at this time, it's, it's the best way of going forward. It seems to be anyway. And also for your commitment, that's, that's um, very important. So you shared who you were and where you're from, so thanks. Uh, please remain on mute and, and if you have any questions then uh, go ahead and use the chat and uh, if you have any resources share them at the end. We uh, will send this PowerPoint to you if you're interested so you don't have to worry about uh, uh, copying down resources or whatever. All right. So before we start, just uh, my name's Janice Haynes, and I currently work in kindergarten, um, but I worked in, um, in junior for 20 years, and just in the last couple went to kindergarten just for a change, shake it up a bit. Um, and I'm at Bell Fountain School in Peel, and uh, yeah, I've been doing this for a long time and love teaching and learning outside, so um, Please feel free to ask lots of questions. Yeah, and I've been around Bell Fountain since 1988, and uh, we have begun a sustainability project, a sustainability school project at Bell Fountain last year, and are moving in that direction using the SDGs, uh, the UN Sustainable Development Goals, as our um, as our fundamental and. Um, I work also for LSF and I'm a facilitator for them. And uh, so facilitating looks a little different right now. Uh, I love you to look at that picture because this is yoga outside in January. Um, oftentimes one of the biggest questions we get is, oh, but not in the winter, of course. And we say, yes, in the winter. <laughs> Okay, so that's what we're into, the, the weather, some tips, and of course our job, connecting all of this to curriculum, and then some final life thoughts and ideas. Okay, so safety. Um, obviously that's important when you're thinking about being outside. It's important when you're inside too. Uh, so you need to think about forecasting risks, dangers, deciding on appropriate behaviors and rules, and what you need to be safe, obviously, if you have EpiPens in your class and you need to think about those things. Um, what we like to do is, is spend a lot of time talking to the kids about it, working with them on making these decisions. Buy-in is a lot better if they're helping make decisions on boundaries, helping make decisions on signals, et cetera. Sometimes we'll do something called a circle up and then they know that they need to come and, and make a circle. So we have uh, discussions or you know, you might whistle, you might uh, do a duck call, whatever, or say something that they need to repeat. 
anything that that's you can get their attention and meet in a certain place is very helpful on the yard. Um, talking about those learning expectations is so important. So, you know, kids, when they go outside, they think of gym, they think of recess. So they re you really need to talk to them about how it's different, what it looks like. And, you know, your first couple of times out, they might be just like recess. They might go a little crazy and that's, you know, you might do some scaffolding. Okay, let's, you know, try and, and work on this a little bit just so they understand the differences. Although with COVID, it's a little tougher to scaffold you know, um, you're going to be out there. So you just have to really work with them on what it's going to look like uh, versus recess. And, you know, all those different things for safety, choosing buddies, having small groups and cabooses. Um, the other thing we like to talk about is time. So estimating time, especially when they're doing something and when you want something completed, but have them involved again. So when do you think that uh, you'll be finished. How long, how much longer do you need? All of that stuff. The way we're right. making outside involves, um, we share the out of doors. We're guests here. Um, and uh, who do we share it with? And uh, how do we show respect to all of the creatures that are outside? And uh, do we go around picking off leaves off trees? Do we go around stamping on bugs? You know, those kinds of things are learned activities. And but by talking about them, it takes a while. Uh, we call it the slow release. And that means that um, it, it is a learned way of behaving, just like every other learned way of behaving is. When you take them into the gym, there are protocols. They have ways of behaving. It takes a while to get complete buy-in. It will take the same while outside, but so worthwhile. Ah, the weather. <laughs> Janice, the weather. The weather. So, of course, you're going to be talking a lot about the weather. And this is big because, um, as we heard on the la another one, that parents, you know, also um, have things to say about the weather. And if you're really, again, proactive, maybe sending information home, talking about we are going to be outside, therefore we need these things. Uh, if you're worried about kids not having the appropriate clothing, talk about layers, make sure they're bringing layers to school that they can put on or take off if they're feeling cold. If they're not comfortable outside or if you're not comfortable outside because you're freezing or something else is going on, then of course you're not going to be happy. So. The, the clothing is super important. You might even think about, you know, when kids come in talking about their clothing. Okay, so um, where would you, when would you use this hat? Could you use it in the fall? Is it a good winter hat? All those conversations are very important. Make sure the kids are in on them. Um, but if you're dressed for the weather, you can enjoy any type of weather. Just because it's raining doesn't mean you need to go in. And there's a lot of cool things to do in the rain, looking through magnifying glasses, even on buildings and structures, it looks different. So, um, so think about, yeah, if you start right away in the fall and develop a routine, then you can go right through until June and there won't be any surprises about the weather. It's uh, often the case where people say, but um, when it gets cold, we'll stay in. If you start right in September and they're out every day or every week or whatever you decide is, is comfortable for you, then the weather gets cold up and down. I mean, as, as uh, Janice said last time, sometimes there's winter days in the fall and spring days in the winter, and uh, it's not necessarily uh, congruent, but we generally are getting colder and then we get warmer. So just to, to have them out regularly, to have them circle up halfway through an activity and say, so how are you feeling about your clothing choices? This is stuff I do with primaries. This is stuff I do with juniors, intermediates, you know, and you know, how are your feet doing? Are your feet dry? You know, is your, is your hair wet? Uh, are you cold? You know, are you good? Do you have something at home that you wish you'd worn? Uh, those discussions. And, and interestingly enough, oftentimes it, it, it's the teachers who also need to remember all these things to bring layers and to bring different pairs of shoes and boots and things. And this year will be a challenge, but we can do it. Okay, tips, tricks, and materials. 
So sitopons, uh, you may or may not have heard the word before, but they are excellent. Um, they're waterproof, they're easy to sit on, easy to clean, and anytime you're outside, it's, it's light. You don't have to worry about carrying a picnic table and they can find spots all over the place to sit on them. And it just makes it that much more comfortable. If you wanna make them together, you can do that. If you wanna discuss how or, how or what would be best to use, you can do that. Um, what I did was I just went to Walmart and got a camping mat that was waterproof, cut it up, and that's their sit -upons. Uh I was thinking even of numbering this time so that they each had a number and they wouldn't be sharing at any time. Um, so that's one really cool thing to make sure you have for outside. Golf pencils, clipboards, also really great. Some people have whiteboards, but um, I think clipboards are probably easiest. And any sort of plastic or laminate to put on top of it helps if the weather's not perfect or if it's a little damp. And golf pencils are just easy because they're little short little things. And when the kids lose their pencils, which they definitely do, then you've got a little backup pencil that you can give them. Um, all the other things like magnifying glasses and devices, those are great to have. Uh, a lot of schools don't have Wi-Fi outside, so taking those pictures and moving closer to the school that, so they can use them is kind of uh, nice to have. Um, and just easy things like we said, the circle up, trying to get people in a, in a space where you can talk to them. Or if you're walking in a line, which I sometimes do with my field trips, I always come back to the middle to carry on a conversation so they can all hear. Um, and then again, also, you know, how's it going? How did it go? Reflecting and sharing during, before, after, all those things are so important to do with the kids. Flexibility just means if you're out there and, you know, you happen upon a frog when you're looking for spiders, it doesn't mean you just dismiss the frog. That's perfect. He came in for a reason. So you get to talk about him, her, and share all the information and uh, maybe try and jump like a frog, whatever works. And then structuring the day, we just thought, you know, it's important sometimes to think about, yes, in the winter when you've got more clothing, why do you want to go inside first, take all your clothes off, and then spend the time getting them all back on. So maybe you want to begin the day outside and end the day outside and make sure um, you've got different meeting places and things like that instead of going in. I'd like to start back at sit upons for a minute. You can make very simple ones out of, uh, uh, plastic grocery bags where you just put a little bit of uh, um, a newspaper or something inside for padding and that's pretty easy and you can write their name on it in permanent marker and they use their own. They can stuff them up their shirts so they don't have to carry them, uh, especially in winter they put them in their in their jackets. Um, but they're also great because you can you can collect things in them. You can put your pencil and your stuff in your clipboard inside your grocery bag. So simple, very inexpensive things like that work. Uh, yeah, and the sit upons, um, what I do a lot of is something called sit spots. And I think it's great for any grade because they're outside by themselves for a period of time, you know, uh, meditating or doing art or um, using their senses or whatever you want them to do at that time. But just getting them used to that. Uh, with kindergartens, I started with two minutes and by uh, the time we got to March, we were at eight minutes and they were on their own, spaced apart, sitting, and we could do a lot of different things with that. So it's a great uh, technique. And I think all of the ages should, you know, juniors right up to grade six um, should be involved in something like that. I've even watched junior kids, for instance, come up to me and say, when we're supposed to be figuring something out and saying, I'm just going to my sit spot so I can figure this out. So eventually they, they see the value in, in sitting and thinking or sitting and trying not to think and just observing, etc. cetera. Um, yeah, the golf pencils, they're, they're a thousand for about 10 bucks um, at, uh, well, I've lost the name of the store. Doesn't matter, you'll find them. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, with regard to best practices, uh, while kids are in a circle, you can teach them to speak for the weather. In other words, if it's windy, what kind of a voice do we have to use? This is, this is drama. And since I'm an arts, arts person as well, um, teaching them to speak up and speak clearly and turn their head from side to side and speak to everyone uh, gives them uh, confidence and voice. And it, it's practiced. If I go like this and say, having a hard time hearing you, 
you know, they learn to speak up and especially your reticent children will learn to do that. Um, it's, it's great training for uh, many things. And uh, that reflection sharing time, never duck it. Afterwards, always leave five or 10 minutes for sitting in a circle somewhere to, if it's not raining out of the sun or whatever and say, so how did it go for you? You know, what could, what could have been better about today? How could we have structured this activity so it worked better? Right. Involve them in making those decisions. And that's how we share our responsibility for learning with the students. Okay. Did we lose our, there we go. <laughs> Okay, getting started. One of the things Janice and I have done at Bell Fountain regularly is starting in kindergarten, starting with the kindergartens right up, it's a K to six school, so we're talking K to six here, um, with a regular schoolyard or community walk. Just draw a circle around your school of, uh, of half a kilometer or whatever and see what kind of a walk you could, you could um, devise to take your kids on if they're juniors or start on the playground with everyone just going around the perimeter, do it daily or weekly. And the question is, what's going on out here today? What's going on with the ants? What's going on with, with the airplanes out here, but there aren't any right now. You know, what's just what's going on with the wind, with whatever, you can teach amazing things just with that question. Um, you can look at what's the same, what's different, all of those kinds of things. Hypothesizing why something happened um, and synthesizing all of those new pieces of information into understanding the big picture about where you live. And uh, there's a wonderful little book out there called I Know Here. And uh, it's basically saying, I don't know a lot about a lot of other places right now, but I know here. And I think that's a, a wonderful goal to set up about your community. Expand your directions. If you're just going around uh, a small part of the schoolyard, to begin with, you can just keep getting larger and expand it and see what's going on. Listen to kids. Um, and you can do all kinds of studies at other times other than the walk. The walk will spawn studies like sh looking at shadows, measuring shadows three times a day in the morning at noon before you go home. Um, taking a look at your own school. How's it built? When was it built? The history of it, the math behind it or even something simple like cloud patterns. Who does not like to look at clouds? And it's fabulous. I mean, we have artists of great renown in this world who look at clouds all the time. So it's fabulous. You can do the dance of the, of the clouds. You can do artwork. You can do all kinds of things, poetry, but always connect it to how it makes you feel, that well-being piece. You know, is this day making you uneasy? Is this day making you glad? Or what's happening in this day? Um, pose questions to kids, but resist giving answers. That's a huge one for us because we're always the answer givers. And it, it's okay to say, I have no idea. What do you think? Or I think I know what it is, but what do you think it is? And, and just discuss it. Um, usually if you give an answer to a child, like that's a maple tree, that's a shutdown rather than something that opens up discussion. So always pose questions. Um, ask questions to students about what they notice. I wonder why that's here. And if they see a grasshopper, I wonder why he's here now. Why wasn't he, was he here in March? Why is he here now? So that understanding of ecology, understanding of your neighborhood is a wonderful thing. And eventually that leads to that level four piece of the social studies business about uh, active community involvement, looking at what's going on in your community and asking, how can we help? Who could we ask for help? Who could we write to to share our concerns with? Um, that active piece that's the piece that was missing from the social studies before. We just had to know about it. Now it's asking us to be involved. So these schoolyard and community walks are a wonderful introduction to what's going on in our community. And thinking about the community issues and schoolyard issues, I've done some stuff with erosion on the schoolyard and I've done it with kindergartens where they're looking at it and able to point it out. And then 
um, think, you know, spend some time putting rocks or things around it to, to work on that, to see if it makes a difference in the rain. And I've also done it with grade fours when they've, um, it became a bigger project where they were asking ask experts, they were bringing information back to the other kids. Uh, they were doing budgets and trying to find grant money and figure out what they would do and planting trees and all of that stuff from start to finish an entire huge project just based on erosion on the schoolyard. So any grade um, can access this stuff. So it's just a matter of, of bumping up a notch for the, jun for the older junior kids. And then they find out who are who's in their community in terms of community groups and they can create partnerships and conversations with those groups. Uh, we have um, the Credit Valley Conservation in our area and they're constantly discussing with them what's going on and uh, how they can help. And Sharon has a question. So can you unmute Sharon and just ask your question? Hi. I'm wondering uh, how you structure your day, um, when you might come inside, um, for what kind of programming, and uh, I don't know, just uh, how you, you know, how you introduce different topics during the day, your math program, your language program, what you need to carry with you outside, those kinds of things, the kind of practical stuff. Okay, so, um, for my day right now, because it's kindergarten, it's a little different. For the juniors, when I did with juniors, it would depend on what we were into at the time. So, um, for instance, you know, I've just, I'll just go back to the erosion one. When we started thinking about that, that might have been just a starting with a schoolyard walk and might have been something somebody noticed and then having that discussion. And then you know, because I've got a really good idea of what my curriculum is, I can think about, okay, so what kinds of things can I get into, like pull in to that erosion study, you know, um, rocks and minerals, uh, writing, I can, you know, I can get people in, they can be orally sharing information, they can do presentations about how they want to design it, they can get, you know, so when I'm outside, they're out uh, measuring the area, learning about perimeter and area because they have to measure the space. They're um, inside maybe doing some research, then back outside uh, discussing spacing for trees or plants if that's what their intention is. You know, so it really depends on where you want to go or what the, where the kids are going. So I can't say that there's a specific schedule that would work best um, it would really depend on what what you are into at the time does that make sense so you're going to start probably where you're you're deciding how the day is structured and you're deciding on a single perhaps perhaps single subject lessons what what we would love to see you move toward is integrated projects where there's many many subject areas being addressed at the same time and um, moving from you dictating how your day is going to go to the kids also being involved in when they should go outside and what they need to do for which project and how they they become active members of setting up the structure of the day that doesn't happen right away but it certainly happens over time because once these things get rolling like a snowball rolling downhill, uh, your job is to sort of manage those things and having class meetings and saying, how do you think we should spend our day tomorrow? What do we need to work on? Uh, where are you at with that project? Uh, how many of you are to this point in your, in your um, project? Those kinds of, of things that go on are, are hugely important because they, they do decide how, how your day is structured. But start definitely the way we said before that however you do it don't have them dress a second time either you when the bell rings you go to your meeting spot and you are already organized as to what you're going to do with your outdoor time or do it just before a recess so that they stay out for recess or just before the end of the day so that they stay out for the bell or however that goes for you the bus whatever and uh, that just makes it so much easier and as time goes on that structuring will become clear and 
and they'll definitely have some say in that and how that works and you'll begin to see it more clearly but integration is your your ticket there not just to think i'm doing a math lesson outside start that way but then say how can i draw language into this how can i draw social studies into this how can i draw drama into this it'll be it'll just make your day so much easier Okay, so connecting to curriculum. So this is the big piece, right? So thinking about focusing on the big ideas and then getting to the smaller pieces. Know your curriculum really well so that you know when you can integrate some of the skills they're learning. So this is what we're talking about when you're going outside. Um, a lot of times, uh, you know, I'll, I'll do a morning and then we're out and we're doing maybe a, a five minute field trip and we're noticing things and then questions come out of that. Or maybe I have something in mind where, you know, I want to specifically focus on spiders because that time of the year is September and I know that there's webs usually can be found. And so that's what we look at. And then we, you know, can bump it up a notch by designing spider webs or, you know, uh, thinking about patterns and all those other things that I can bring into it. Um, and then sometimes the kids want to take pictures and then share that information. So there's it'll come out of all of these things that you're starting you just have to kind of you have to know your curriculum so well that you're able to think about okay yeah i have to do you know i want to do persuasive writing at one point and this fits perfectly with them um, thinking about erosion on the schoolyard that we can go to the principal write some letters to the principal um, persuading them that we need some money in order to complete this or or whatever so uh, read your curriculum a few times so that you really get that and then thinking in questions and encouraging questions all the time. We kind of touched on that. And uh, you're, you know, you can even just look at your school and think about, I, I know energy in grade five, you're kind of looking at the roof going, okay, so if we were going to put solar panels on the roof, how many do you think we could fit there? You know, how much um, electricity will they produce? What's the cost of it? All those things you can do outside looking in, you know, it doesn't have to be inside and even sitting down and, and jotting things down or data management on clipboards all of that stuff can be done outside and then if you want to, to go back in and you know research or whatever post things on your boards like put their questions out there you don't need to be the expert in fact it's better when you're not because kids kids can figure things out and, and they can do the research um, you can be there to be the guide and you can do your own research, but um, don't, don't feel you have to know all the answers. In fact, as I said, sometimes it's better when you don't because you don't become the answer machine. You can, you can safely say, I'm not sure, but you know what? That'd be a really cool thing to find out. So specifically, uh, math is the big one, right? And people think, how do I do math outside? So when you're thinking about math, really think about the process. Um, don't necessarily think about the, the smaller things, but of course, um, you can easily look at buildings and think about math and, and geometry and shapes and, and uh, arrays and counting and all of those things. They, they certainly fit into any built environment, but really think about the process and that's I mean these are at the beginning of all of the math curriculum so um, just something to think about yeah that's uh, that's lifted right from your curriculum so if you haven't had opportunity to take a look at that just take a look at it it will keep you on the track of the big ideas and those little calculations etc will come up in projects sometimes kids will say I can't remember how to do the mean you know, if anybody forgets how to do that, come on up here and we'll have a refresher. So it, it suddenly becomes important to know how to, how to calculate the mean when it's in situation and when they're trying to figure it out with a bunch of data and, um, and then they want to know. So don't, don't fall into the trap of worrying too much about how that's going to go, but but rather look at a project and see how much uh, curriculum you can drag into it by integrating. So when I think about math in my schoolyard slash community, what 
opportunities come to mind. Think about natural environment as well as built and cultural community. Now, a lot of people might say, I don't have the schoolyard that you have or this, um, but I also don't have the built community or cultural community that you have. So you have advantages there that we don't. So um, even walking around your neighborhood and looking at structures is kind of cool. So just examples of fall ideas, if you're looking at planning and designing gardens. So even that, just getting the kids outside, looking at garden designs and planning them, including cost analysis, fundraising, all of those things, what plants you would put in, who you're trying to attract. I mean, it's huge. And if you can use existing gardens on your schoolyard, because then you don't have to worry about um, all the red tape that comes with creating a new garden on school property. Oh, well, um, it can be done. It can be done. We've done it, but it's a lot more work. So if you've got one that's just, you know, floundering, um, it's certainly something that you could take on. And, you know, squirrel studies, those are simple, like looking at squirrels and, and doing all the math around that. Building studies, traffic studies, if you've got a school that's right in a in a busy area that, you know, you're looking at what's happening and how that affects your community. Uh, like I said, hunting for spiders and spider webs, um, fall equinox celebration or cultural celebrations outside. Um, and all of those things are gonna fit into it, financial literacy data for sure. So I'm sure as we're talking, you guys are thinking, oh yeah, yeah, I can see that. Or thinking about your specific community and, and what kinds of things that you could think about just doing with them close to the school when they're in the backyard and the important thing is they're involved in every step of the way making the decisions as to how it will go and calculating the area for each exhibit or how much money they would need for this certain part of the celebration or who would they invite and why and how it would go so that is the um, that's the learning piece and they find it a lot easier than us sometimes to integrate and all those things into something because it only makes sense that we need to look at a lot of different areas okay so this is really just trying to give you an idea of the possibilities because uh, I know a lot of people that are just starting are kind of saying, oh my God, like, what am I going to do when I get out there? So um, we just kind of threw down a lot of different things with a few examples just to get you started. So community walk, schoolyard walk, you can do that in so many different ways. It can be just observing and listening to their questions or listening to what they notice. Changes over time, you've got so many cyclical opportunities there. Um, if you go on the LSF website, there's a place where you can grab, uh, what's it called, Pamela, now? Um, the one that shows the cyclical opportunities. Mm -hmm. You can sign up for a newsletter and it'll tell you what's happening in your area. Um, so uh, whatever, whatever time is, whatever, whatever, you know, insects or animals are in the area at the time and things that are happening. So it comes bi-weekly, I believe. Yep. And, uh, that one for all of Ontario, it lets you know what's going on uh, outside in nature. And if you're not an expert and you say, I'm not a science person, well, neither am I. I'm, I'm the artsy fartsy type, so I needed this thing. So that's why I started this and LSF picked it up. So it's, it's a what's going on outside piece. And uh, it will give it. you lots of ideas. Step Thank outside you, nature's guide. There we go from Thank Sam you, Sam. Step everyone. outside nature's guides. Yes. So um, that's pretty cool for you to kind of see, okay, yeah, it's happening now. And so I know this particular spider is on this particular plant. So that, you know, it'd be fun to try and go find it. Um, anyway, so also you could go with a plan in mind. So looking for spiders or doing different things. Sometimes, um, I know in the winter time we all look at their boots and we talk about traction and then we go to the hill and then they try and get up the hill and you know so just simple things that we're thinking about based on the weather and and what's happening outside or noticing problems and solutions that was the erosion stuff uh discussing changes that you or the students and the students would like to see so maybe they want a butterfly garden maybe they think solar panels are important 
maybe um, geothermal is something they're thinking about. Okay, so will that even fit on our schoolyard? You know, how does that work? The other easy one to do is just do uh, leave one part of your, you know, cordon off one area on your playground and have one side grow and the other one ke keeps getting mowed and just, you know, looking at that over time is pretty cool. And the diversity, et cetera, et cetera. A good way, to, way of doing it is just to leave the edges all the way around unmowed so that mm -hmm. uh, the center is still mowed for other purposes in the schoolyard. Yeah. And then discussing issues and helping with solutions. This um, example, you can click on that at one time and then because you're going to get this. So you'll be able to see this Weed Lake project. And this is a really cool uh, group of kids that takes on um, something in their in their community. The other thing, I mean, play and explore outside, like support their inquiries and interests that develop. So if they're creating tunnels out of mud, that can lead to structures, bridges, etc. Also just working outside. So if you want to just read outside, take the time to do that. It's also, you know, for their mental health, art, phys ed outside, cooperative games. That's awesome to do with juniors and primary to get them thinking about working together. And then that makes all your outside stuff even easier because they're relying on each other to, to work together. Um, creating and designing outside. So looking at your space, can we design an exercise trail? Can we design a Frisbee golf course? Can we create a winter play day? All of those different things. Mental health, yoga, sun salutation, sit spots, reflections at the end of the day, very important. Integrated learning, um, you could do a live learning event. So, so what I've done before is taken a social studies and done the whole thing outside. The kids have taken it on. They've done the teaching. They've brought other kids out to do activities. All of that uh, can be done outside. Mapping, of course, following directions, finding different items, looking at all your um, north, south, east, west, learning where the sun rises, sun sets. All of that stuff can be done outside. Schoolyard field guide, you can get the kids thinking about, you know, what a field guide looks like, what it's, what it's used for, um, what kinds of things go into it, how to design it for, and who's your audience. All your class meetings can be outside, expert talks, and even when we talked about beginning and the end of the day outside, which is really important. If you're starting outside, we as a whole school do our 20 minute DPA in the morning outside, and then uh, I usually stay outside with the class. Um, and then at the end of the day, we always get out earlier and have that piece of time for sure as well. One thing, who has touched this land before us? That's a history interesting thing. But also, who touches this land now? And uh, what, what else is out here? And what are they dependent on? What is their habitat? And, and uh, why are they here? It, it's um, just looking at the land, being connected to the land. And one thing I would say about that right now is uh, even in institutes, I always encourage um, teachers to take the time, five minutes in the morning, five minutes at night, go outside, uh, not for any other purpose, but to go outside and say to yourself, what's going on right now? How do I feel? How am I, how am I doing? It's so much better outside between these, uh, these webinars, Dennis and I were both going out for a walk because uh, it's important to clear your mind. It's good for kids. I've had kids say to me when they're inside, I need to walk around the school once and give this some thought. And what am I to say to that? But go for it. Now that's, you know, that's along the way, but I want you to be thinking about the fact that they actually will start understanding themselves as creatures of the earth and, and how they do relate to feeling better when they're outside and, and clearing their mind and, and walking on, on dirt instead of pavement. <laughs> okay, so this is where you have to do some work. <laughs> Uh, you don't have to listen to us for the whole time. So just really thinking about your curriculum. What are some questions that you could ask about each of these pictures? So, you know, this is kind of like, okay, this is my school. I'm standing in front of it. What might your students ask? What curriculum could you mine from each? Um, you know, looking at the building, what kind of questions? So if you just want to throw them up on the chat, just looking at the building picture, what kind of questions do you think you could ask or what your students may ask?
Awesome. So if you're standing here in front of that building and you happen to be in, in grade six, for instance, something you might pose, they might pose it as well, as what are those flags? What do they represent? And that leads you into community partners and, and uh, all kinds of things, uh, grade four, grade five, uh, about government and uh, how it works and um, what it means to be a citizen, uh, all kinds of things, just from standing there looking at a flag. You might also notice, once again, go to the clouds, look at the way they're shifting. Like those are fabulous <laughs> clouds that you can do lots of things with. But even windows, you know, you mentioned something like simple like windows. Primary kids can count windows. And then they start getting more sophisticated and counting by groups of, you know, groups of six or whatever. And then they start thinking about how many windows are there on the building? We can't see, we can only see one particular or two particular walls. How many do you estimate around the entire building? Uh, why are those windows shaped like they are? What do they cost? Who installed them? What are they made of? And why are, why are they the way they are? in terms of heating or cooling. You can get as sophisticated or as unsophisticated as you want, like that. Yeah, like how many bricks, how much cement? It's great. So looking at the tree, what kind of questions would you think about if you're standing there in front of the tree? I know a couple of people have already put them up, but. Someone in the last webinar asked, why is that tree all by itself? <laughs> That's a very good question. Yeah, why isn't it green anymore? Exactly. So, you know, to stay, and you can, you can just go there for a while or you could linger. I mean, you could teach your whole year on that tree, actually. It wouldn't matter what grade you were in. You could use that as a, a starting point for, for all curriculum for any grade. It, it could lead anywhere. So it's very important that you get your creative juices going, that, uh, that you start to think very creatively. Yep, yeah. use it seen, exactly. <laughs> I had somebody uh, once, one of the teachers say that something about a worm, you could find your entire curriculum in a worm and you could, if you can, you know, if you just think really open-minded about all the different things that you can access through a worm. Sure, I had one child one year who decided to do, we were doing public speaking and he was giving a speech and he said, I'm doing mine on mud. I think it's extremely interesting. <laughs> and you know, some of the other kids are like, what, mud? <laughs> you know, so it doesn't matter what it is. If you're, if you're passionate about it, you're keen about it, you can sell it to anybody. <laughs> okay, great. Thank you for adding in those awesome questions. Okay, so we're kind of near the end. We've only got about eight minutes left. Um, so this is where we really want you to think about whether you have any thoughts, ideas, questions, ahas. Uh, if, if there's something you need from us to continue to support you, of course, we want you to contact us if you need anything, but uh, feel free to take your mic off and, and uh, tell us what you think or if you have a question. Uh, with regard to resources, if you go on the R for R website or the LSF website period and get yourself to resources for rethinking, um, there are well over a thousand um, uh, things in their database and they're downloadable. Most of them are free. Um, incredible resources for right from one off uh, how to get your kids outside for five minutes to whole studies, lesson plans amazing things that are right there at your fingertips. There are no lack of resources. There it is there on the screen. And um, sign up for Step Outside, Nature's Guide. It just comes to you and you read it in five minutes and you go, oh, <laughs> that's what's going on. It's fabulous. And then you feel a little more comfortable and you maybe know uh, what you're looking at and uh, feel like you're one step ahead of the kids. <laughs> So it's, it's a fantastic thing. That's what LSF does and does well. Um, so feel free to do that. Feel free to contact us. Our information is there. You'll get a copy of this, of this slide um, presentation if you want. And um, 
you can, um, yeah, you can have a look at what others have said and uh, there you go. We'll send the slides to everyone, says Sam. There's a couple of uh, questions, Pamela. So the first one, do you generally take the learning from kids questions as a class and guide everyone through or is everyone on their own discovery? Uh, usually for me, it's a, it's a case of we start off with one thing and it may not be, you know, a long term project. It may be short um, and then it goes into or it may morph into other things. And some kids may go this way. Some kids may go that way. Oftentimes what I'll say is, well, we seem to have two ideas. Who'd like to work on this and who'd like to work on that? So you've got two things going. It's manageable, right? Um, and you can get up to six or seven things going eventually uh, on the same project. So just different facets of the same project. Stick them all together at once uh, to begin with. Um, you know how to do that. It becomes, goes from being teacher directed to being student led. So somewhere along that continuum, you know, is where we're all headed. And uh, it uh, starts off simply and eventually it grows. And it might be one question, but you, I generally like to make sure they have a lot of options within that. So if it is one thing we're working on that, that they can all come at it from their point of view, from, from what they're interested in. Um, so it doesn't necessarily need to be 30 different questions. It can be the one question, but as long as you really think about providing a lot of choice and, and letting them uh, come at it from where they're most interested. The other question we had was how do you best support students who don't have the clothing needed to stay warm or dry? Um, now we've this con this question came up a few times and I know some of the teachers have said um, things that were left behind they kept so that they could have them as extras. Um, again layering is super important so even if they can just bring in layers that helps. And sometimes uh, I know other teachers have asked for donations uh, and things like that. So it's possible to make sure um, that students are supported. I know my mom used to go to garage sales and buy boots and clothing and keep it in the classroom. Again, with COVID, it's a little tougher. You have to make sure, you know, if it's something that the child needs that, you know, um, we've often found something and then sent it home and it becomes theirs. So. Uh, that's if anybody else has ideas feel free to share on the chat uh, and another question was how much time do you spend outside one day a week every day um, so personally I'm out every day uh, currently I'm in kindergarten when I was in junior it would depend on what was happening it was every day for DPA and then uh, usually a meeting and then it depended again what we were doing at the time. Sometimes it would be a full day outside, sometimes it'd be half, sometimes. So, um, so yeah, it's, but every day is, is easy. And right now in this COVID situation, I think that's probably what everybody should be going for because uh, being outside is, gives me less anxiety than sitting in a classroom. Yeah, I, I would say I'm, I'm with you on that, Janice. It, I made a uh, pact with myself from the very beginning that I would go outside every day, even if it was five minutes, literally five minutes before the bell, taking everybody out, looking at something, doing a five minute field trip, boom, the bell rings, they're gone to recess, whatever. But as you become more comfortable with it, I think, I think still think one of the best things you can do is just tag in to recess, tag into lunch break or nutrition break, tag into the beginning of the and the end of every day it's an easy way to get your feet wet with this stuff they're already dressed are there any more questions okay um so i guess our time's up and uh like we said this you can have this so pamela if you just want to finish off with our little um do not go into school. Yes, do not go into school this year with 2019 goals. I think you already realized that. That's a no-brainer. This is 2020 for what it's worth. Have 2020 goals. And the experts are saying, here are the concerns with everybody, whether it's going to school or going to the grocery store or whatever. It's safety first, connection, mental wellness, physical health, and maintaining relationships. 
Do those cooperative games feel like a team, feel like you belong together? That's the cool thing. And get outside. Oh, awesome. <laughs> Thanks so much for coming. Have a great day. Thank <laughs> you.